I just got the notification that we're on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. There's people in the back or in front of me too that are giving appreciation. Thank you for being here. Um, we are going to get started shortly. Um, our program will officially start at 105. So thank you so much for being here. Representative Callan, shouldn't you be oh, on your nose or something? <laughs> Top priority for me, right here. Welcome to folks who are just hopping in. Um, we just have two more minutes before we get started. Um, summit will officially begin at 105. Thanks for hopping in. Hello, Mockingbirds, viewers, and sponsors. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a mom. Shout out to my fellow parents out there. Um, I'm also a bit of a jokester. <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes I just wish my kids weren't so offended by frozen jokes. I think they should just let it go. <laughs> um, welcome to our annual Youth Leadership Summit. I invite you to pause, quiet, and reflect as we open this acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish, Interior Salish, and Yakima Nation tribes, and to thank them for allowing us onto their land. They took care of this land before it was colonized, and they continue to care for, honor, and defend their land. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of the native tribes of Washington state. I would also like to acknowledge the historical and systemic exploitation and oppression of indigenous peoples, enslaved Africans, and other historically underinvested people, which has led to the disproportionality in representation 
of these communities among the youth we serve and whose voices we seek to elevate. I ask that we keep this in mind as we work to transform the systems that have and continue to impact us. Thank you for taking this time to ground yourselves in this acknowledgement. Today's summit is sponsored by the Schultz Foundation and Coordinated Care, Casey Family Programs, the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Washington State Department of Commerce and SDM Consulting, the Group Health Foundation, the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families, the Dropbox Foundation, uh, Seattle Children's, the Rakes Foundation, and the Medina Foundation, as well as Summit Law Group. Thank you to our generous sponsors for making today's Youth Leadership Summit possible. Now, I will pass it to Sierra to talk more about Summit and youth programs. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you to everyone who's joined us here virtually. Um, I am super excited that we get to do this. Um, for a lot of us, it's our first time. Each youth led chapter will present a policy proposal based on their ideas for transforming foster care and ending youth homelessness. Proposals will then receive feedback from members of the Washington State Supreme Court Commission on Foster Care and the Office of Homeless Youth Advisory Committee. I also want to take a brief moment to explain some of the changes that are going on in Mockingbird. Um, we actually have an additional region and edited some of the regions that we represent. If you look over, it's to my left over here, um, but you'll be able to see um, our different regions color coordinated, and I'll explain them a little bit. The blue region is our eastern region, or formerly known as the Spokane region. Um, we decided to name the eastern region to be more inclusive to not only Spokane, but to other counties um, that represent that eastern part of Washington. Next, we have the green region, which is our central chapter, um, formerly known as the Tacoma chapter. We also made that more inclusive to central Washington and those surrounding counties. Purple is peninsula. Um, we have a few that show like Olympia um, and added Tacoma into that as well. Then we have King County um, that includes the King County chapter or the youth advocates ending homelessness. And then we have our brand new chapter, which is the Northern region. And that region includes Wacom, Skagit, Snohomish, and the San Juan Islands. And we actually have representation for that region today. And if there's any questions on that, we can also take questions on that in chat as well. I would love to do some opening remarks as well. Um, next, we will have Justice Barbara Madsen from the Washington State Supreme Court Commission on Foster Care and Gage Spicer from the Office of Homeless Youth. I would love to open it up to Madsen to speak with us and then following up um, Gage Spicer. Well, thank you, and um, it's wonderful to be here at the summit again. Uh, I do represent uh, the Commission on Children and Foster Care, and uh, we have a co-chair who is here today as well, and that is um, Ross Hunter. Uh, I wanted to take just a minute to say um, how grateful the commission is that uh, Secretary Hunter has personally become uh, an active member of the commission in the past uh, there's been a designee, but uh, Secretary Hunter has uh, taken such an interest in uh, the work of the commission that he has personally become the representative. So uh, we're delighted uh, with that development. The Commission on Children and Foster Care was, um, was first ordered by a Supreme Court order <clears throat> in 2004. And part of the reason for that was the courts recognized that we have only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to uh, youth in foster care. And so it really, we understood very early that we needed to collaborate with partners who could improve and uh, bring more resources to youth in foster care. And those who are in extended foster care, although at the time the commission was organized, I don't think there was such a, a notion. So 
Uh, in 2004, we um, organized the commission uh, and the mission of the commission is to provide all children in foster care with safe, permanent families in which their physical, emotional, intellectual, and social needs are met. And our strategy for doing that, improving collaboration uh, between courts, child welfare partners, and the education system to achieve the mission. But I'm very pleased to say in the last several years, we have also recognized the need to partner with youth, people who are affected by the, the foster care system and who can bring that much needed perspective and understanding uh, about what, what people in foster care are facing, what their needs are and how together with people who have the power positions, uh, how we can make those things happen in real life for real people. So uh, I am so pleased that our uh, strategy has improved uh, and expanded to include youth voice. And this summit is one of those examples of including youth voice. We are so proud to be able to uh, help to sponsor this, um, this summit. Uh, we are here to listen. We have uh, a very dynamic commission that is uh, staff that is uh, that has membership from all aspects of the child welfare system, uh, who can and do bring energy and commitment to working with all of you. You bring wonderful ideas to us every year through the summit. Uh, you've achieved so much legislatively through the actions that you take during uh, the course of the year, the planning of this summit. Just to name a few, and probably the one that's most important. Uh, to me, in, in one sense, is the, the effort to get compensation so that we can have the lived experience of youth coming to all of our commissions and committees to really help us to understand what the needs are and to make the appropriate changes uh, so that we can help uh, to make this experience as, as rich as it can be. Uh, another um, aspect that you are and have been very successful in, I remember you talking about it at your summit last year, and that was building financial capability for youth in foster care. I think that's a terrific idea and it came out of this summit. You have, uh, as a group, uh, really brought forth some great, really thoughtful ideas. And I'm so excited to listen to your ideas today, uh, to be able to collaborate you, with you in the fall to help to bring those ideas to legislation and hopefully to bring that legislation uh, to a passage uh, in the next legislative session. So thank you so much for all that you've done to prepare for this summit, for the ideas that you're sharing with us today. And I look forward to, uh, as do all of the commission members, to working all, with all of you to make these plans uh, become reality. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Manson. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gage Spicer. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, hey, Sierra, good to see you again. Uh, and I sit on the uh, OHY Advisory Committee. Uh, I serve as a lived experience member. I'm 23 years old. I have lived experience with homelessness, and I am currently the vice chair. I want to say thank you, everybody, for uh, allowing me to be here uh, and allowing the advisory committee to be here and uh, to listen to all the topics that are on the table today. I think it really speaks to the power that Youth Voice holds uh, in this space that we have, we, we get to listen to these topics and we get to take action on them moving forward. I really am excited to dive into this work um, moving forward and to hear the topics on display. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got really, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad to see familiar faces. I have limited view, but good to see you again, Gage. And thank you so much, um, Barbara, for joining us. Um, it really means a lot. Um, next up, we have our board president, the one and only Tasha West Baker, who will talk about the changes at Mockingbird and moving forward. After we have Jim, also the one and only here in person to talk about um, how he found or how he founded the TFS. Hi everybody! I'm so excited to be here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm super jealous that Jim gets to be there in person because I so very much wanted to be, but I have this thing called a job, which they, they make me do. Um, I, I actually love it, but um, I love what I do and I'm very grateful to be here. 
Um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes, one, to say thank you guys for letting me share space with you once again, letting the old lady talk at the young people's event. I really appreciate that. Um, and just to say that, like, the last couple of years at Mockingbird have been like they have been all over the world, right? We have been challenged. Uh, we have transitioned. We have grown. We have had our staff transition and grow. And um, it's kind of a little like contents under pressure, but you know what comes out of pressure? Really amazing things, right? Diamonds come out of pressure. And that's what I believe Mockingbird is, is that it is a diamond. And right now we are just really in our refinement process. We are going to glow. We are going to glitter and shine brighter and bigger than we ever have before um, because that's what happens when pressure creates great things. And so I'm so excited about where we are going. We are in the process of just really becoming revisioning like many organizations had not walking away from what we've believed in all this time, but figuring out how to do it new and different and better and more engaging than we ever have before. Um, we are on the precipice of hiring a new executive director, one that we um, prayerfully is going to come and like give us fresh energy and fresh wind and fresh light. And we have lots of new young people getting involved and bringing us fresh energy and fresh wind. And we are just excited. Um, and I stand in great expectation of what Mockingbird is going to do in this next season of its iteration. I cannot wait to see what you guys do. I love this event. This young people doing what they do is why I sit on this board it's why I have graciously served for the last um, three years. And I'm excited to see what y'all have to teach us because we learn from you equally as much as you do from us. And we are grateful for the gifts and talents and skills that you guys are bringing to this work. Um, and if this is what the future looks like, we're in great hands. So thank you for giving me a few minutes and um, I'll turn it over to Jim. Awesome. You are the best. Thank you so much. Jim, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Sierra, Tasha, and Caitlin for, for this uh, opportunity to speak to you today. As noted, I'm Jim Theophilus, the proud founder of the Mockingbird Society and the executive director for the first 15 years. Currently, I'm the founder of the executive director of North Star Advocates, and again, the proud member of the Office of Homeless Youth Advisory Board. Thank you all for being here today uh, to celebrate the 2022 Mockingbird Youth Summit. And I am grateful to be in the room. Tasha, I think I just whined more than you did, and, and they let me join them in person. Uh, and I am grateful for that. Um, and I'm grateful to all the support you've all given to the Mockingbird Society and the brilliant young leaders here today and across the chapters over the last uh, 20 plus years. As with every year, I know you will be awestruck by the young people who will present their hard work and ideas with us today. As I told them yesterday, they stand on the shoulders of some amazing young people who are now professionals in their own right who came to give us over the years such systems reforms as extended foster care, legal representation and dependency hearings, sibling, vi sibling visits, and the Mockingbird family, and other landmark reforms. And just like them, we all stand on the shoulders of some remarkable state leaders and decision makers who made space over the years to hear from and elevate young leaders from the Mockingbird Society. Names and people and um, amazing leaders like Justice Bobby Bridge, First Lady Trudy Inslee, Representative Ruth Cady, then Speaker Frank Cha, current Speaker Lori Jenkins, and then Representative Alex, Secretary Ross Hunter, and of course Senator Carlisle and the Governor's Lock, Great Wart, and Inslee. A long history 
of leaders who truly understood the benefit in helping them develop policy by having those with lived experience in the front end of the conversation. In fact, the Mockingbird Society sparked a fundamental shift in creating that change of elevating youth voice, insight, and leadership of the young people with lived experience to be at the table as respected partners solving complicated problems. I always say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. These young people are creating the menu. These past few years, as Tasha said, have been very difficult for all of us to say the least, and extremely difficult in our community of nonprofit organizations. That's why I'm so appreciative of Tasha and the members of the Mockingbird Society Board of Directors and the staff at the Mockingbird Society and the young people for persevering through these tough times. I believe when I started Mockingbird, and I believe even more strongly today, that Washington is a better state with more equitable policies and budgets, and indeed a better society with a strong, robust Mockingbird Society. I thank each of you for your ongoing support to this unique organization. In closing, I heard once whenever you give a speech, you should say, in closing, <laughs> if nothing else, give the audience some hope. <laughs> so in closing, I want to just recall one summit many years ago uh, in the 2100 building, and I was sitting in the back of the room and start talking to this young man. And he was dressed with a big, thick stocking cap, one of those weather coats that zipped up to the top and big boots. He hadn't had gloves on his belt clip. And so as we talked after a while, I said, so uh, we're sitting in this kind of warm room. What's going on with the clothes? And he said, well, I just got to the emergency shelter late last night and I saw a sign up that said, go to the summit. And he thought he was going mountain climbing. <laughs> At the end of that summit, he talked about how his life had been changed way more than taking another hike. So well, after 20 years of these young people and all of us coming together, we know why we are here. And we know where we're going. We know what that mountaintop looks like. Strengthening families, reducing, eliminating this purge on our society of young people surviving on our streets. We know the, 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 the vision we're after. So I close again by just repeating a favorite quote of Mockingbird over the years from the amazing American, James Baldwin. For these are all our children and we will profit by or pay for whatever they become. Thank you. You know, Jim, you just always know what to say, like in the best way. Every time, I don't think he ever fails. It's always so good. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tasha, also for coming on and sharing with us. Mockingbird has a strong legacy that we continue to see shine through. Next, we will be going into the presentation portion of the program. Each presentation will, live, will be lit live just so you know, $5 every time I mess up. <laughs> um, each presentation will be live followed by a 10 minute Q&A session. The first chapter presenting will be Seattle and Neva Advocates Ending Homelessness Members. This chapter covers the King County region. Good afternoon. We are the King Youth Chapter of the Mockingbird Society Youth Program. We are presenting upon the topic relating to expanding the extended foster care criteria. This topic was brought forth to our chapter as chapter's attention because of the huge population of foster care community were aging well into homelessness due to the lack of supporting programs supportive programs. You may be thinking, but wait, James, there are programs already there for them to access. Yes, you are correct. However, due to the pandemic, 
you know, it created a wait list that are heavily backed up for months, minimum, at least. And with the backup wait list that are causing these youth and young adults to not receive any support anywhere. So therefore, we are asking for the extended foster care criterion to be extended or to be changed to reflect success like it was first created as a goal. Currently, there are multiple states in the process of changing their foster care and extended foster care criteria for better life outcome of these youth and young adults and are finding huge Im improvements and results. The current problems of the extended foster care program are it's being blocked by entry requirements, such as it is required that the youth be still be a dependent of the state after they turn 18, as well as it falls on the youth to stay working or in school and prove that they are or are not meeting requirements to get federal funding. The system fails to inform as well as support the youth with adequate funding. And the amount that extended foster care has been receiving has stayed the same, even though the cost of living has gone up. As well as the age, the current age out of extended foster care is 21, whereas Everything else we see is the age of later on in life. Uh, so uh, given that, I will pass it on to my colleague. Hi, my name is Lacey, um, and I'm going to share my personal story. The way I ended up in foster care was I found my mother passed away when I was 16. By the age of 17, I soon found myself in foster care on top of being pregnant. The foster home just was not a good fit for me. It felt, I felt grown up enough at the time that housing would have been a better fit for me. So I ran away from my foster home when my son was three months old. Soon a warrant was out for my arrest because I left placement. Even though laws have now changed, here is my story. I was so close to my 18th birthday. They found me, placed me in juvie, and took my son into the system. This was very traumatic and traumatizing, and my first time in juvie. If I would have had a chance to automatically have opted in to extended foster care, or at least have been told about extended foster care, um, this would have helped me a lot. I soon returned to my foster home after an emotional and physically draining time in Juvie. All my son's stuff was around my room. I was crying the whole time in Juvie. So once again, I left and was found and put in Spruce Street. I was, uh, and then I left again. I was nervous to reach out about services due to trauma and PTSD with the system. Soon my son's dad went to prison, leaving me homeless for four years, and soon losing my son permanently, getting my parental rights terminated. My social worker did not help me. Instead, she asked a lot of questions, but not get the services I had needed. Hello, my name is Miranda. Um, Extended foster care is a great way to help our youth make the transition into adulthood. Considering this fact, the voluntary entry is not the best option. Instead, opting out can help young adults utilize this program. Next, we need to remove barriers and requirement to entry and participation. In addition, we need to assist with a monetary increase to reflect real-time cost of living which depending on the reason can be 3K a month. Lastly, young adults age out at 21 and it needs to be extended to 26 by implementing a step-by-step -step process that creates less dependence and more financial independence.
There was a federal bill passed in late 2020 called the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021, which pro provided a one-time allotment of 400 million in additional funds added to the state's foster care budget. For extended foster care, youth and young adults till 26 years old. Annie E. Casey Foundation created a fact sheet that states are using to calculate this 400 million of extended foster care relief funds effectively across the states, which has been estimated in creating more than two and a half times the current amount of supportive services that states has, which could provide critical supportive outcomes of nearly 900,000 young adults nationwide. A study by Chapin Hall found that particip participation in extended foster care led to a 19% drop in homelessness, even after aging out. Unfortunately, there are still young people in extended foster care and after extended foster care are experiencing homelessness. Upon numerous studies relating to the development of a human brain, a human brain isn't developed fully until 25 years old, which means that these 21 year olds are aging out, aren't fully prepared to live on their own because those four years difference is crucial for these youth and young adults to build successful foundations of adulthood. Requirements are necessary for funding. We understand that obstacles are for our solution and we are working on the implementation. The benefits, these benefits are great and gives youth an opportunity to expand and grow and become more independent. A youth's brain is not fully developed until the age of 25. How can you fully be able to live on your own by the age of 21? At the age of 21, your brain is physically not mature enough to be financially ready. All individuals deserve access to these funds is their rights. Youth who have been affected by not knowing about extended foster care should be reimbursed because it is not fair if they were not told by the system about extended foster care. Expanding the eligibility will help individuals in different situations that may have barriers to be able to jump through all these hoops the government is asking them to do. All foster care um, youth, young adults have differently lived experiences and may have a lot more problems than just being able to attend school or work. Imagine a higher class family, an individual who is 21 or 25. How many, many of you were cut off at 21 or received from help from your family members? In conclusion, this issue was revealed during another crisis of the pandemic. We have seen that we were given the option of a temporary measure to fix that does work, that needs some tweaking and fixing, as well as a long-term solution. And right now, the big issues are the people that are not in the system that need to be in the system were not told about the system as well as not enough young people are getting the money that they deserve due to the fact of the cost of living is increased. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I also wanna give a little bit of a shout out to the engagement coordinator of King County. 
Al, thank you so much for helping us bring them together. Uh, yeah, I think on camera, but thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing for and foster and being vulnerable. You are all amazing. And I'm going to pass it to Lauren um, for the Q&A portion. Thank you, Sierra. And thank you um, to all of y'all in the King County chapter. Amazing, amazing work. Um, I see a hand from Tanya McClanahan um, on the commission on foster care. Um, Tanya, go ahead and unmute and share your question. Um, the young people will be able to hear you here in the room. Okay, thank you. So I guess just some clarifying pieces. Isn't the window to get into extended foster care very slim anyway? No? I thought there was a, a small window to even get into extended foster care. And then, so, go ahead. So it is a voluntary thing. So that's, I'm, I get what you're saying by, by it being a small window, but that's why it's the issue and we're asking for it to be an opt out so that you are automatically enrolled in extended foster care. And if you don't want to be in it, that's when we can change. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so when you're in this, do you get housing case management when you're in extended foster care? I mean, is there, you know, something to help you be sustainable throughout or does it just end? So when you're in extended foster care, you'll have a state case manager, but regarding like, support programs and stuff like that. That's other agencies, agencies that are providing services and stuff. Um, right now, the idea is to expand extended foster care because there's a wait list for these support programs for those individuals that have not reached out. I totally agree with you. I guess what I'm asking is, do you get those life skills? Is that part of the deal when you're in extended foster care or is it just hit or miss depending on who it is? It, it really depends, you know. Um, there are some foster parents that will teach you independent living skills, you know. There are foster parents that don't. It, it's really hit or miss, you know, but there are, like I said, there are programs that will teach you these, but there's wait lists, you know. So maybe some foster parents should start doing that. <laughs> I, I was just wondering about the state piece. So you're signed into extended foster care and are you getting, is, is that a protocol, so to say, where every youth gets this amount of life skills or you know housing case management or something? Is there any of that or you just signed in and that's it? Currently there is none of that. Um, You'll hear later on down the line from one of another chapter is a solution that they have potentially to this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see Lori Lippold and also Secretary Hunter. I'm not sure who's came first, but we do have time. I think we'll have time for both. So let's, um, Lori, let's first go to you and then uh, we'll do Secretary Hunter following. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. I'm happy to defer, uh, but I'll be quick. Uh, thank you all. It just a fabulous presentation. And I love hearing about this issue and ways to improve. Um, and you've identified a number. And um, I also just want to say thank you, Lacey, for sharing that part of your your life story with us. You probably all said this, but clarification. Right now in extended foster care, the dependency continues until 21. Are, are you saying get rid of the need for dependency at 18 or between 21 and 25 or maintain the dependency until 25? Can you just clarify that? Thank you. So right now the the program is set for dependency between the ages of eight and 21, but right now they are 
a dependent of the state even while in extended foster care. One of the things that we are trying to change is after the age of either 18 or 21, I cannot remember right now, uh, is to still have these extended foster care benefits, but not be a dependent of the state. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Secretary Hunter, please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Secretary Hunter, we can't hear you. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. You'd think I'd have figured that out by now. Um, it's only been two and a half years. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Um, my question, so can you give me some specifics about what services you're experiencing wait lists for? Well, a lot of it is housing, you know, transitional living programs, rapid rehousing, diversion programs. Um, there's some agencies that do employment and education. There's wait lists for those as well. Thank you. Um, we do, it looks like we've got about um, three more minutes if there are any other questions or comments. Oh, I see um, Justice Madsen, I see your hand, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is, you were talking uh, in your presentation about um, the criteria. My question is, um, would the criteria that you would need to have changed be only at the state level? Because I know that there are federal uh, uh, regulations as well. So I'm, I'm wondering um, if, if, we, if this project is gonna be successful, do, is that gonna require changes at the federal level as well? As of right now, no, we are not looking to change anything on the federal level. Um, we are only looking to change things on the state level right now. As well as there are some several states already that have brought this idea forth and have been implemented on a state level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gage, I see your hand, please go ahead. Hey, yeah, just one more clarification uh, question. So um, increasing the benefits to 25, is that the, the I'm seeing head nods, yes. 26. I just wanted to make sure I got that right. <laughs> um, we said 26. So basically it's going past 25. And we'll exit on your 26th Thank you to the Youth Advocates Ending Homelessness Chapter and the Seattle Chapter for an amazing presentation, for fielding the questions that came your way. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions of this chapter. And I just want to thank you all so much. <laughs> Yeah, what awesome responses and questions. We really appreciate the engagement here. Um, and the cyber model means a lot to us. Thank you, King County. Go celebrate. <laughs> okay. Next, we have the Northern Chapter presenting on uh, record expansions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Megan and this is Sadie. Today, we are going to be presenting about equitable, accountable stealing expectations, or EB for short. Juvenile records create challenges and barriers throughout people's lives. Having a record that follows you can lead to dismissal of any growth you've made as a person and prevent you from obtaining things like employment and housing. This can prevent problems in accessing other needs as well. When I was 14, 
I used what I thought was an abandoned vehicle for warmth and shelter, and was later charged and arrested for vehicle felon. Even though I completed all the court requirements and went through the process to seal my record, I was unable to have it sealed because of the restitution owed. I later was able to pay my restitution and seal the record, but it was too late. It had already been shared. And even though it's now sealed, when I apply for work, that conviction is being seen and preventing me from getting a point. Although Washington State already has legislation in place to automatically seal records when a person turns 18, it is ineffectual. Restitution is a clear barrier for young people and is only one of the many in our legal system that is disproportionately affecting marginalized populations and especially Black people. Also, in our research, we found no systems in place to hold people who are wrongly sharing sealed records accountable. Furthermore, juvenile records being public makes sealing nearly pointless. Someone's record cannot be shared unshared from the internet, even if it's sealed. And having records be public makes it difficult to track who's accountable for the sealed record being shared in the first place. We want to create a system where the people sharing sealed records are held accountable and sealing your record is both more accessible and effective. In order to do this, we want there to be a fine of $15,000 when a sealed record is shared, $10,000 would go directly to the victim, and $5,000 would go to funding a program to support young people in paying off their restitutions. Ideally, we want restitutions to be eliminated as a barrier for having your record sealed, and we are aware and support the work that Stanford children have been doing to reach this goal. Lastly, we want to make all juvenile records confidential. This would prevent records from forever living on the internet, being shared with third parties, and make the people that fall if a record is shared easily identifiable. We recognize that our ask last year to expunge records had a lot of challenges. We've adjusted our ask. This solution is attainable and will give young people the opportunity to grow and break free of the stigma and confinement that comes with having a criminal record. This act is directly reflective of our mission to be anti-racist and support LGBTQ youth. Work with us to give young people the opportunities they deserve and need to be successful adults. Let's go with the easy solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Sabian. That was a powerful presentation. Um, we're going to open it up for questions, and we actually have a, a little more time for questions here. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short and, and sweet to the point. Um, so please, uh, Mr. Jefferson, please go ahead with your question, and then after that, we'll go to Senator Wilson. Uh, you mentioned a fantastic uh, a presentation. Uh, thank you so much for doing it. I think that you are, are, are doing great work. Uh, by making the, this request. Uh, you mentioned uh, what the, the Stanford children study or something of that nature. Could you could you explain what they're doing? That would be helpful. I do not know exactly how they're managing it. I was informed by our pp and a team, specifically Liz Troutman, that uh, Stanford, <laughs> <laughs> that Stanford children is working a lot this year uh, on legislation pertaining to restitutions. And from my understanding, I think it is pertaining to just eliminating restitutions for young people in general, not specifically as a boundary for having your record sealed. All right, so do you think maybe there should just be a restitution uh, fund that's available that, that's not associated with the youth so that the person that victimized gets paid back, but the, the youth is responsible for it? I ideally, uh, 
It is it is complicated. I think in a perfect world, it would be a situation where there is some kind of panel or process to go through case by case, because I do think there are situations like in Megan's circumstance where they did uh, they did research and thought they truly found an abandoned vehicle and reached out and even tried like made sure that. Uh, checked in on laws about what an abandoned, abandoned vehicle means, how you can obtain one, all that stuff. Like, I, I don't think that's fair. I do also think that if people are just willingly being harmful to property and people, that there does need to be some kind of consequence. So it's, I don't think it is as simple as creating a, a one-all solution. Uh, I do really like the idea of having some kind of fund to support young people and paying off restitutions. This is something that is easily identifiable as uh, consequences that specifically target poor people, similar to speeding tickets and other things. If you're rich, it's not a crime that matters to you. And I don't want this to be yet another example that is not only specifically targeting marginalized peoples, but targeting poor people as well. So a way to solve that while also making sure it is still a fair system for the people who have loss of property or personal values or Save their safety uh, is is the goal, but um, figuring out a way to bridge that gap is really important. I just want to thank you so much for your uh, information and your words. And um, we are doing um, and have worked on a bill last session that did not make it all the way through the Senate. It made it through the House on sealing records. And I have a stakeholder group that's been working and will work throughout the interim to make sure it comes back um, this session and would love to make sure uh, that folks are part of that stakeholder group. And so I trust someone on this line will uh, reach out and let me know. So if you're not connected, uh, you will be connected because I think it very much is something uh, we need to look at. I also love the solution or the thoughts you have around uh, the fine and around how it is that we hold individuals accountable. And usually there are, they're not individuals, they're businesses and industry that um, oftentimes just kind of um, let go of that kind of information. Um, and I also think your thoughts about, um, we have to always think about victims in this case, but we've done a lot of work around things around parent pay and around pay for um, individuals who are incarcerated where we are expecting them to pay and what that does is put them and their families even further behind um, and further away from uh, being out of poverty. So we have to think about those systems that we've set up and how we disrupt them. So um, just thanks so much for your thoughtful conversation and uh, it does impact so many folks and I'm looking forward to getting a solution uh, that allows young people to become old people and their history doesn't follow them. Um, so thanks so much. Thanks, thanks Dr. Wilson. Wilson. We can definitely. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> we can definitely um, connect and make sure that you're able to connect with the presenters after this. Um, let's go to uh, Emily's question next. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I think in last year's proposal, there were some crimes that weren't eligible for sealing or expungement. So I was just wondering in this proposal, um, if there's any crimes that wouldn't be eligible for sealing. Those were part of uh, the, the mentioned vaguely challenges that we faced the last year. Um, I think in regards to uh, making sealing more effective and eligible, uh, making juvenile records confidential, which some other states have already done, is will be immediately effective. Um, we still want to work and meet more with other partners and organizations to identify whether how to best handle things like uh, sexual offenses and more violent crimes. Um, there is substantial research that shows the young people that commit those crimes are not repeat offenders, and there's a lot of data around being a product of your environment, and especially young people experiencing foster care and homelessness, having a severe lack of healthy examples of what a relationship looks like and what consent looks like and other things have a huge part to play in this. And also we want to 
acknowledge and be vocal that we recognize that uh, it is also can be a very unfair feeling for the people that are the victims of those crimes. Um, so it is a difficult balancing act and something that we are still working on in the background. Thanks, Sabi, and I'd love to hear more about that as the ideas progress. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Are there any other questions or comments for uh, for this chapter before we move on? Oh, Justice Matheson, yes, go ahead. As long as there's a minute. Um, I, I just was curious. I know um, that these standards are generally uh, are legislative, so you're going to be looking for some legislative changes, especially with respect to um, restitution. But I specifically wonder what, if anything, the courts could be doing differently. We, we obviously sentencing and, and things like conditions uh, are often set by the legislature, but but sometimes the courts have a little bit more authority. So are you able to speak to that, what what you might have in the way of a recommendation for the court to be able to be um, a participant in this solution? Uh, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I do have a question in, in regards to records being confidential, is that something that courts have the power to change or is that also a legislative ask? I don't know what power y'all have in that perspective. I, I could just say that I know Justice Yu and I have had some conversation about the importance of making sure that uh, all parties are part of that conversation. So Justice Matson, I think it's a really important uh, thing to think about as we think about every perspective and the impact so that the intent is is the way we expect it all the way around. So uh, I just think it's incredibly important. And I'm writing notes as we're speaking. So thanks. Also, I have the mic. I just want to give out a shout out to Tanya and like everyone else on the commission. And I miss y'all so much. It's really nice to see your faces even though it's over Zoom. So. Thank you, Sabian. I just had to put Sebastian in the in the minutes. I don't think anybody else understands that, but for how long I called you Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, and Justice Matson, we can definitely follow up on your question to get you some more information on that. Um, Thanks. That's that's it for um, Q and A for this chapter. Thank you, Northern Chapter. Uh, Savian is the new engagement coordinator for the region. So thank you for your leadership and research. And Megan, thank you for the same thing and your experience and what you bring to the table for us. Um, we are actually going to go into a break, um, 10 minute break. So grab a drink, um, get something to eat, take a walk. Um, I'm also going to be getting a drink. Mine is a caramel macchiato, extra shots for all those who are wondering. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we will be right back and we'll also have the chat open um, if anything comes up. So we will see you again. We did amazing.
All right, everybody ready? All right, everybody on the live channel, we are coming back. Hope you enjoyed your break. Um, we are going to dive right into it. I just want to let you all know there is a ton of love coming from the chat and YouTube. You look at your very famous. <laughs> Um, what do you right into it? Um, next presenting um, and representing is the Eastern chapter. Come on up, y'all. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm Mayana, and these are my partners in advocacy. I'm Jayla Young. I'm Pink. I'm Kaylin Wallen. My name is Joseph Cook. And we're located in the Eastern Chapter. I have a quick question for you. What did you learn in high school that you actually still use today? Here at the Mockingbird Society, we created an acronym that encompasses everything that we believe to be vital life skills um, for young adults as they graduate high school. This acronym is known as START or Student to Adulthood Readiness Training. We hope to teach students skills that they will continue to use in everyday practical situations. The ultimate outcome of implementing START in high schools would be a lesser number of homeless and jobless young adults. When you hear the word homeless, do you picture me? I was one in 4.2 million youth who experienced homelessness nationwide. But do you know what else I am? I'm a first generation college graduate, a registered behavior technician, a Washington State champion bowler, an ordained minister, the current Miss Puget Sound, and a top 10 candidate at the Miss Washington organization as part of the Miss American Scholarship Organization. <laughs> According to a study done by the Association of America, Excuse me, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, only 55% of high school students feel prepared to enter adulthood. SART aims to get that percentage to as close to 100% as possible through life skills training and education for all students. It's super important for a good foundation of life skills knowledge for all students because it might just be the key that prevents them from ending up homeless even outside of the K-12 education. For example, I graduated high school at 17, Three weeks later, I turned 18. Three months later, I was living in my car. Statistically speaking, I should have never ended up homeless. I come from a two-parent working household, and as far as I knew, we were financially stable. The problem was, my parents never felt comfortable discussing financial information with me, so I was very misunderstood in what I understood to be financial responsibility in adulthood. At 17, I thought I had a good grasp of adult life. All I saw was legal maturity, the ability to spend more time with friends or traveling, and the ability to buy lottery tickets. When a series of unfortunate events led me to have a severed relationship with my family and on my own for the first time at the age of 18, I was completely unprepared to navigate in an independent adult life. I quickly realized I needed to learn how to figure out how to buy car insurance, how to grocery shop and cook, how to open a bank account, and how to manage a budget. And that's just a few basics. And that's really only the tip of the adulthood iceberg. I had never previously considered things like the car buying process, job and apartment applications, health and dental insurance, or how to file my taxes. You know, the things that my parents took care of because they had already established for themselves but never felt comfortable sharing with me because they didn't know if I was ready. As I think back on my high school years, nothing stands out for having prepared me and contributed to my success now at 24 years old. Well, except for the ability to multitask given the practice of eating lunch in 15 minutes while also cramming for the exam I had the next period. So our proposed solution between to solve the knowledge discrepancy between grade school and adulthood is the START program, the Student to Adulthood Readiness Training Program. This class we kindly refer to as an Adulting 101 class. It is a preventative measure against homelessness and youth struggle. In this class, you would be exposed to local resource programs, as well as adults in the community in the form of guest speakers who are willing to help you outside of the community. This class would be taken early in the high school career. It would replace one of the four electives and would be a requirement to graduate. The class curriculum would include realistic expectations for adulthood, basic communication knowledge, 
skills, basic technology skills, financial literacy and its nuances, basic business knowledge like resume building and interviewing, cooking and grocery shopping, basic tools and mechanics, and first aid. Along with the class would be an online portion in the form of a website that would cover all of the topics covered in class, as well as have a list of resources provided. A 2017 T. Rowe Price survey conducted revealed that 69% of parents were reluctant to discuss any financial matters at home. 23% of children said they discussed finances with their parents. And 35% of kids stated their parents are uncomfortable or unsure of how to discuss finances with their children. Flash forward to 2021, and household debt was equivalent to 101.1% of an individual's disposable income. The national average for income in 2021 was about $75,000. That means the average household had debt of about $27,000. To further expand upon START, it currently costs $24,000 to $99,000 a year per every homeless person in state funding. There are currently 1,777 homeless youth in the state of Washington. We are asking for 884 new positions in the 884 public high schools that Washington State has to offer um, for educators to teach START. The average wage of a Washington State educator for high school is $54,000. The cost of educators teaching START would be approximately $52 million. Exactly, though, it would be $51,919,000. $436 per year. If we use the same $54,000 as an example of the cost per homeless person annually, since it falls within the range previously mentioned, the cost of supporting homeless youth per year would be $104 million, or exactly $104,361,433. Our program only uses about half the cost of supporting homeless youth. The benefits of our program are as follows. Our solution is more cost-effective, provides more jobs, prepares youth for adulthood, and would decrease youth homelessness with the state and schools investing in their futures. Hello. Student to Adult Readiness Training, or START, comes both with positive, positive outcomes as well as a few underlying challenges. First and foremost, some parents might be uncomfortable speaking about financial literacy at home. So what better way to do it in a classroom? Now, some of those parents may be uncomfortable with some of those content and material provided being discussed in the classroom when those could be provided at home. <clears throat> also, some students may not be able to finish school. Take me, for example. At the age of 12, I entered foster care and was bound from home to home from school to school across Washington State. I ran away from many foster homes and I also spent some time juvenile incarcerated. It was very hard for me to finish school as much as of the desire I had to get my diploma, especially being a first generation to get a diploma that I didn't receive. Eventually I did get my GED after many battles, many years fought. I spent a lot of time confused about the ropes and trials that I had to undergo, not sure what school to go to because of my general background and it's for how to talk due to the structure. What are we doing to invest in our students' future? We spent 12 years investing in our education. What is one year that to spend investing into our adult life post education? You've all just learned about what START is and how utilizing it will help to decrease some really drastic and negative numbers of youth homelessness as well as save the state a lot of money. You've also heard some really hard facts about the numbers of homeless youth and young adults in Washington State. Although we realize and acknowledge that there are challenges in implementing START, we've also created solutions to many of these obstacles already. Through our chapter meetings, we've had numerous deeply pondered conversations about how START is drastically more effective than the current system in an array of areas. We have come to the conclusion that no obstacle that stands in the way is bigger than the impact that STAR will have. So thank you so much for your open minds and soft hearts towards this issue and solution, for being here today, and for choosing to spend your time participating in real change. 
I trust that your presence here signals your willingness to start that real change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eastern Chapter. Are there any questions or comments for this chapter? Oh, Tanya, I see your hand and then I see Lori. So Tanya, why don't you go ahead? Tanya with the Commission on Foster Care. I thank you very much for this time and thank you for bringing this forward. Um, it sounds so simple and so needed and to save generations by with one year of start. I just, I mean, it seems so easy that we should have this in place. This is life skills. This is ongoing, you know, sustainability as independent adults, right? You have my vote on this one and anything I can do to help, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for the support that's coming through the Zoom chat as well for you all. Uh, Lori, go ahead. Lori is with the Commission on Foster Care. Lori, the poll. Thank you. Thank you, Eastern Washington chapter. Um, nice work. And again, for those of you who shared part of your personal stories with us, thank you very much. Couple of things. One is, have you seen or talked to people in other states where they have this and heard about the impact it's had? And then my other question is, you talked about the money, and I'm just curious if you've thought through options for making it a requirement. Is that the legislative? I know Board of Education plays a role, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I thought I answered it the best I can. I believe out of the four electives that are required to graduate high school, our goal is to make this uh, mandatory uh, class. I mean, comprehensive skills and life sustainability post education is going be one of the most important things for a teenager. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, just a little follow up on that. I guess what I was wondering is to make something a requirement, who, who has to do that? Like, do you get a law passed or what? Um, so correct me, guys, if I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> all I know uh, is that we had actually um, been in contact with OSPI and the um, Board of uh, Education. Um, and we actually didn't get the chance to um, meet up with them um, before this summit. Um, but we definitely want to afterwards to talk with them and kind of discuss that in more detail to kind of figure that out. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I see Secretary Hunter's hand, and then following that, we'll go to Senator Wilson. So I guess I have two questions about this. Um, the first one is the cranky former legislators question, um, which is if you're going to um, propose $50 million a year investment, you would want to understand what the likely outcomes are going to be. So um, it's really important to talk to people in other states. You probably need to have an evidence base around an investment at that magnitude of what the actual effect was. Um, you know, this is the same way we do for prevention programs. You know, is there, are there programs where you can do an estimate of what is likely to occur? I guess that's my, my question for you. And I don't expect you to have an answer I, t t in this moment, but I would think that if you're, going to try and approach someone in the legislature who might be responsible for making decisions about how to spend $50 million a year, I can almost guarantee you that person's going to ask for it, because I would have when I did that job. Um, the, the more practical question I have for you in the short run is, we provide independent living skills um, and I know we're doing some looking at that program about how do we improve the effectiveness of it. Is this something that we could do for young people in foster care specifically? I, mean, I don't have control over all of K-12, for which many people are grateful, but 
I, we do have some influence over what we offer in this program. Is this something you guys would like to see uh, in our independent living skills program? So to touch on the first question you asked, um, I have reached out to other states, but I do, I am aware that the Puyallup School District has implemented a financial literacy class as a requirement for their high school graduation, I believe. Um, I don't think it's a part of the Common Core, but it's more of an after-school type program. And in the year or two that they've done it, they've seen a 25% graduation rate increase in their students. Um, on the second question, we would absolutely love to see this implemented and be something that's offered for the foster care system. But the whole point of me sharing my story is that I didn't grow up experiencing homelessness or the foster care system until after high school. And then even though I was statistically not likely to end up homeless, I did because I didn't have those resources and those skills and that knowledge before I graduated out of the K-12 education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jayla. Um, Senator Wilson, please go ahead. Yeah, we passed a piece of legislation this last session around financial literacy within the K-12 system. And so it's a beginning, but I'll say you know, this fits right into career and technical education. It used to be called home and family life. And it used to be part of what every student did. And the more we added academic requirements and the more we did the system of credits, the less opportunity there was to do this. And we see this, many people saw this as elective as opposed to life skill and life requirements. So very much something that um, we could look at. And my interest is both inside the K-12 system as well as outside. Because if we're talking about young people, oftentimes we don't get them until after they've left a system that's not working for them. So how is it that we create these um, as opportunities to keep young people engaged in school and motivated? And a lot of that is that project-based learning and uh, different ways of learning. So we'd love to, to deepen the conversation um, around that because it fits in both sides. Um, as we think about what young people need, but very much um, it has to be driven by what you know you need versus what adults in our system say they needed when they were your age. So it's a very good point. That was something that when I was through high school, I at 17 thought I just knew everything there was to know. I thought that you couldn't tell me whether I was right or wrong about anything because I wasn't going to listen. Um, the thing for this topic is this has been a topic that's been personal and close to my heart since my own experience being homeless. Um, and through the Miss Washington, Miss America Squash Organization, I've, I've started a social impact initiative called Adult-ish, the survival guide. So it's basically everything that we've encompassed here, but built in a way that's accessible for any student at any age, even those who aren't technically students, because Something that I have learned as I've traveled across the state, speaking to different schools and to different programs, is that life skills are important whether you are five years old or you're 55 years old. There is something that everybody can learn in life to be successful. Um, I've started in elementary schools where I talk about communication skills, how to shake somebody's hand, how to address a letter, things that I thought my 22-year-old former roommate knew, but he didn't. And uh, there are things that people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are first-time car buyers or, or homeowners that don't know the processes for getting those applications and what forms they need to fill out. So there's plenty of opportunities for skills that can be learned at any age range. And I think that keeping people engaged is doing what um, I have been currently doing and have been doing for the last couple of years, is just traveling and speaking on my own experience, because I think that's something that has been really interesting for me to know and to find out is that as I'm sharing my own story, more people are connecting with it like, oh my gosh, I did not realize how much I needed to know from the time that I was 18 to now in my early to mid 20s. And I would have loved the opportunity to share that or to learn those things earlier in life. But then the, the introduction of the website makes those resources available outside of the requirement for high school graduation. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for your questions, um, for thoughtfully listening to the Eastern chapter. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions now. But if folks have further questions or comments, um, please put them in the chat. and um, We can follow up with you later or um, reach out to us. We can make sure we get those answered. Like we can give a big shout out. Uh, that was a really strong presentation. Thank you all. Just in case I needed to felt like this. <laughs>
Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to the regional engagement coordinator of the Eastern Region, Ryan Tobiasen, who is a monkey bird. Thank you all for an amazing presentation. Yep, you're good. <laughs> Hi, Brenda. I love it. <laughs> um, next and finally, we have the Peninsula chapter um, doing a presentation on minor consent to housing. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you for coming to support and listening for our topics today. My name is Bunny Garcia Owens and my pronouns are they and them. Um, and this is the Peninsula chapter and these are my amazing fellow chapter members. Hi, my name is Erin and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Emily Abel and uh, my pronouns are she, her as well. We are, um, besides myself, all of us are new, even our engagement coordinator, Nick, who is not up here with us, but off to the side. Um, we are able to pull this together in such a short period of time, and we're so excited to be up here advocating and answering questions today. Just want to give a quick shout out to Queenie the Dog, our fifth unofficial official member and Peninsula team mascot. Um, every time I look at her, she makes me so happy and I know that she's been spreading joy everywhere she goes because everyone come up, comes up to her and she's like, and of course she loves love. So like all of us do. Okay, kind of be serious. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you had zero control of your basic needs and safety? For many young people, that is a reality that they face. When it comes to housing, youth under the age of 18 cannot consent to transitional, low-income, emergency, or stable housing in Washington State without a parent or guardian approval. As it stands now, after 72 hours of being in a shelter, youth have to go back to their parent or guardian if they do not provide consent to other, for other alternative housing options. This is an issue because without parent or guardian consent, youth are turned away and sent back to abusive and unsafe environments where they might be experiencing physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, and or financial abuse and neglect at home. In many cases when this is happening, parents or guardians deny minors consent to other housing options as punishment or retaliation for running away or not wanting to stay with them. Unaccompanied and unaccounted for youth who are experiencing homelessness can access resources to get housing and don't reach out for help because they know they won't or can't get guardian or parent approval. This leads to shelter hopping in unsafe conditions for youth, which perpetuates the youth and young adult homelessness system. One of our chapter members who couldn't be here with us today is a young mother who understands the connotations and anxieties that come with working and that come with talking about minors and consent. On the other hand, she is a person who works within the youth and young adult homelessness system and has homelessness and housing instability experience. She has seen situations in which youth would be better supported in other housing options. In our experience, also working within the youth and young adult homeless system, housing options for these clients are very limited. And usually, other community supports are needed to ensure the youth is safe, fed, and can actively work on their school, life skills, and housing goals. So what are we proposing? With the data we've collected paired with our experience and work, our ask is to lower the age of consent for unaccompanied minors to access emergency, transitional, and permanent stable housing, largely determined on their circumstances. We feel the circumstances that would warrant a youth of these ages to consent to their housing would be youth experiencing physical, emotional, mental, sexual, and financial abuse and neglect, uh, unaccompanied youth whose parents uh, can't be located, uh, denies their request for consent, or can't and unable to give consent, and minors who going back to their current housing would cause harm to their physical and mental health. Along with consent to housing, the minor would also be consenting to completing coordinated entry or CE, 
which also is, includes a needs assessment um, and agrees to engage in regular case management while in the program. Uh, we're still figuring out the details, but essentially this is how the process would work. Uh, so a youth, uh, a minor is referred to a housing provider and a housing service provider does an initial intake and then attempts diversion. If diversion is completely impossible, uh, the service provider would then proceed with CE. And then during CE, they would be uh, administering the needs assessment in which uh, basically it just takes into account the minor circumstances and matches them with the appropriate housing option. Once the appropriate housing option is finalized, housing providers would assist in finding, obtaining, and stabilizing um, housing, as well as provide rental assistance and other community supports the minor needs. Um, and then once the minor is exited and uh, you know they are in permanent stable housing, follow-up care would you know be provided as well. Out of the data we collected, a concerning statistic we found on domesticshelters.org is that 10% of minors in Washington State who seek shelter are turned away because they don't have consent from a parent or guardian, compared to the national 4.8%. Like, let that sit in for a minute. Um, Washington State has no laws regarding minor consent, so we refer to 12 states that allow, you know, unaccompanied minors in specific circumstances to consent to various housing options um, that would ensure safety and promote appropriate development. Um, one example is California's Family Code 6924. According to Chapter 3, Section B, a minor can consent to residential shelter services and deem mature enough to participate intelligently in services and is an alleged victim of incest, child abuse, or would present a danger of physical or mental harm to others or oneself without access to said services. Currently in Washington State, currently Washington State allows minors to consent to medical services, including mental and behavioral treatment. Behavioral health treatment. California most likely came to this solution after seeing the same things we see working with homeless youth day in and day out. That behavioral and mental health challenges are directly correlated with housing instability. Why wouldn't a minor be able to consent to both then? We're looking into you know unintended circum unintended consequences, I should say such as youth being placed into housing options that open up to unsafe situations, or you know, they don't you know, promote positive development. Um, but on the other hand, Erin can relay some benefits. Thank you, Emily. Some of the benefits youth have from this proposal would be youth having the power to speak up and advocate for themselves, Youth having the accessibility and availability of safe and se secure housing. Neglectful parents wouldn't be able to or wouldn't be able to deny youth shelter and less dangerous or precarious situations in which, which youth may have to shelter hop or couch surf. Overall, our goal is to ensure that unaccompanied youth have the access to emergency, transitional, and permanent stable housing. Unaccompanied youth should be able to self-consent. When fleeing unsafe scenarios such as abusive or neglectful households, often these young folk will sometimes not seek shelter due to the uncertainty of no parental consent and not having the ability to self-consent. This should not have to be the case for any youth. No youth should be sleeping on the streets because of the lack of parental consent and self-consent. We want youth to stay safe and have a roof over their head, the bare minimum for any human. That starts with the access to self-consent for unaccompanied youth. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We are now opening the floor to questions. That's amazing. Excuse me. Thank you for that. Very powerful. Um, Kim Justice from the Office of Homeless Youth. Kim, please go ahead with your question or your comment. Yeah, thank you, Bunny, Aaron, and Emily for your wonderful presentation. And I just want to applaud you for um, bringing this issue forward. It's uh, certainly a very important issue and also a tough one to solve. 
But as you said, every young person deserves safety um, and shouldn't have to be staying on the street um, because they have nowhere uh, to seek uh, safe housing or shelter. A um, couple of questions I had were, um, you mentioned lowering the age of consent. I didn't hear if you, if there isn't like a lower age on the consent, if it's any youth under 18 um, or if it's um, a particular age. And then the second question I had, um, because you mentioned that there are limited housing options, which there are in particular for minors, there are very limited housing options. I'm curious um, your thoughts on what other services or housing options might be needed, uh, particularly for young people who are not gonna return home, but may not go into dependency, um, given that shelters for minors are short-term, what are, you know, what kind of housing or additional services um, young people might need? Thank you again for your presentation. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, to answer the first question on the age, we that was something that we were really just researching on. Um, one thing that I guess I forgot to mention on the speech is that in Washington State, a minor that is 13 can uh, consent to medical services, including mental health and, you know, SUG treatment. And so, you know, that's just, to me, I feel like that's really positively correlated with housing instability um, for minors. So I would say we're still dabbling on that, but 12, 13 was, which is a shocking number at first. It's a little unsettling, but there's lots of good benefits to that. So yeah, that's around the age, but I wouldn't quote me on that. Oh, okay. Um, to answer the second question, uh, could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second? Yeah, no problem. Um, just wondering if you all have thought about what services or other housing options might also be needed for, for youth in these situations where they're providing their own consent and they may not be able to return home, but they also may not go into dependency. Yeah, so that was certain things that like when we would be doing coordinated entry and we administer a needs assessment, it'll be based on what the client needs. Um, we're not sure what that would look like yet, the actual assessment, but make sure cover all the bases of what a youth may need in that situation. Um, what types of supports. Uh, and then I think that really determines, I mean, specifically within our region, just to name off, like we don't have a youth shelter in our county, at least, Jefferson County. And there's one little uh, youth drop-in center, so to speak, in our neighboring county column. I'm not sure about the rest, uh, Olympia or Tacoma, I believe. Yeah, Tacoma and, uh, you know, the rest of the Olympic Peninsula as well. But um, I know that in Jefferson County, with OLECAP that we work at, there are emergency shelters. We have our own our emergency shelters that are like cabins, so to speak, two rooms, two beds in each room, and essentially we could house people um, that are like in a pinch up to 90 days while we get the mother housing. And we have one of those cabins dedicated to youth only. Um, and then another thing we dabbled on is host homes, which would be some coordinating and some trying to find people as well. But that's about it. Do you have anything else to add? I, we're, we're still researching the options, so to speak, but a youth shelter, host homes, and um, yeah, I, I, it's I'm not, there's one other one that I couldn't think of, but does that answer the question somewhat? Yeah, thank you so much. And feel free to reach out. We'd love to, our office would love to work with you all on this. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. We'll, we'll be sure to follow up with you on that. Um, Tanya, I see your hand. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. I just want to give a shout out to this chapter, woot woot, for this area. Um, and also, I'm just I'm just trying to envision what this would look like and who would who would be oversight and who you know because we don't want institutions right. And I'm just wondering if maybe there was like state and federal dollars that could roll down and 
enhance our local drop-in centers and maybe build some in those areas. So I know Mason County, for example, they I think they're on their second year, you know, of running one. And then there's one in Bremerton and Balfour, one of the B towns over there in Mason County. You know, so that's what I'm wondering because it you don't want state children being run by another state entity, right? And this is giving you youth your more independence. So I'm just wondering if we couldn't take it from that angle because housing is such a crisis we know for everybody nationwide. And so, I mean, like right now, people can get vouchers, but there's no place to take the voucher to kind of thing. And we don't want a backstop either. So I just wondered if you thought about how, what that would look like, what that dream, you know, picture would look like. Um, so immediately what comes to mind, and I think that, you know, just because we were so new, I think a lot of it is like, we were thinking of what if, what if, what if, what if. So I just, we haven't even gotten to that, but, um, what comes to mind is I think we've mentioned that we need an adult shelter in Jefferson County. So yeah, essentially federal dollars coming down, maybe if there is a program that would be able to fund that in creating one. And then the drop-in center maybe could be expanded um, as well as any other counties that need to be expanded. So yeah, essentially I think that would work, but I think we're just still working that out. So thank you for that question because that's something didn't even know needed to do. Thank you for your work. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think another one that we could look into, because I do know of one like night shelter, overnight shelter for youth in Tacoma, but I know that a lot of youth have been struggling there in general, and it's been struggling a lot with funding, so maybe something around that would also be great. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that in as well. I almost forgot. Oh my goodness. So um, another housing option I think would be also like grant funding. Uh, I think that I'm not sure if it's a federal or state grant, but my landlord actually has um, a house that was like an old Victorian style house that was changed into six apartments and are solely for youth 18 to 24. Um, and so that would be maybe an option later on that we could like get referrals transitioning into that. I'm not sure if that really goes with something, but that's just something I didn't even think about. I actually live there and it's a great program. It actually works essentially with case management and it helps you like learn things like cooking, which I don't know how to do. So it was like things like that. Um, so yeah, lots of just out of the box thinking I think needs to happen. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question from Lori Lipple. Go ahead, Lori. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peninsula Chapter, for taking on this very tough issue. I am curious if you talked about how this fits or intersects or not with the CHINS process, Child in Need of Services. So I remember when we were just in our little workshops working with our group, we did touch on that. Um, there was something that one of our advisors had mentioned that that might come up and that is something we looked into, but just wasn't able to come to a conclusion. So we are working on that and we can follow up with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have just about one minute, probably got one or two minutes left if anybody else has a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't think anyone else like raised their hand. I just want to have like a quick thing since we're like the closing, the closing. So you guys on our end sound like robots. <laughs> so I, I was like, I can't with this funny thing. I thought I was like sitting there like listening to speech. I wasn't listening. Um, but this is like Summit 2022 hybrid robot version. It's this is the special summit because it's robot version because we only hear robot voices. The audio comes in here. Just wanted to add that. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the important stuff. So that is all the time that we have for questions. Um, but I am seeing that there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we'll make sure that we respond to that we didn't get to um, verbally. 
Um, please feel free to um, reach out to us with questions as well. Put my email in the chat. Um, and we um, are now uh, going to be moving into the next portion of our program and turn it over to Sierra. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm all about the shout outs. Thank you, Peninsula Chapter, for your topic. Also, uh, <laughs> thank you, Nick, the new regional engagement coordinator for the region for leading the team. And also, the Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Literally the best thing ever. Oh my gosh, guys. We did it. Are you kidding? We did it. Thank you, everyone, for participating at today's virtual summit. This is our first hybrid summit, and we managed. Great job, team. I want to say thank you to the facilitators, organizers, and tech support team for making it all run so smoothly. Let's give them a big thank you. Thumbs up, jazz hands, reactions, chat, whatever you see. Fingers crossed that next year we can be together in person, all of us here. And um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we do really important, crucial work and we couldn't do it without young people's voices. All right. Facts. <laughs> Every single one of us on this call made this year's virtual summit possible. Thank you all for showing up authentically. I appreciate each and every one of you. I look forward to the next time I can see you all in person. We have Secretary Hunter from Washington State Supreme Court Commission on Foster Care and Rodney Robinson, a Chair of Office of Homeless Youth. And um, we have, um, I think, I think that's all I guess that we have. Um, first, we'll start with Rodney, and then we'll follow with Secretary Hunter to close us out. Thank you so much. And I just can't resist. I am not a robot. I am a man. Sorry. I just <laughs> could not resist that. No, I would just, I, first off, I want to thank our young people um, for their innovative ideas and their willingness to kind of share their learning and life experience with us. Uh, this, this has just been a phenomenal experience. Um, I'd also like to thank Mockingbird for taking the time to work with our young people so that they are eloquent, their level of advocate, advocate, advocacy is sophisticated and they and it's solutions based so often we invite young people into spaces and encourage them to share but we don't take the time to properly prepare them to make sure that they are comfortable and that their passion um, is expressed in their advocacy so I really want to thank Mockingbird for that as the chair uh, for the OHY advisory council we have a lot of work to do uh, and I look forward to seeing how we can work to create solutions uh, and the, the final thing is just to remind folks that all for all of these wonderful ideas, this is only the beginning of the solution, right? So there are some, several things that need to be worked through. Uh, I'm encouraged by the chat and seeing all the, le the level of support that our young people can expect. Uh, and I also want to encourage us as service providers, politicians, and other policymakers to make sure that we incorporate our young people in the process of finding that solution as well. Um, so serving on panels, bringing them in and compensating them for their lived experience and also their intellectual property. Uh, again, I just wanna thank everyone for the invitation to come and share this time with you. Uh, this has been the second time that I've been able to attend an event like this. And I look forward to taking all of these ideas back, not only to the advisory council, but also to Pierce County, which is my uh, my home area and start to work on these solutions. And again, I just really, really wanna encourage us all to look for our young people, look to our young people as partners um, and not a product, right? Not a consumer, but partners in the solution. An investment, and to Jim's point with the wonderful quote that he started off with, an investment in the young people is really the investment of in quality of life for all of us. Uh, thank you, and I'll hand it over to, to Ross Hunter. Here we go. I'm up. Um, I, the host has highlighted my video for everyone, which is exciting. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm here at our King Street office because I've got some in-person meetings today, which is sort of nice to have. This is not my first or second summit. Um, I've attended many of them over the years and in different roles in the world. And I, I am always impressed at the 
level of sophistication and the willingness to share their personal experience that we get from young people and how many of those ideas over the years have been implemented. Um, the voice of, of people with lived experience has power and can be heard by, by state legislators, uh, can be acted on. I, I do appreciate the, the level of sophistication and, and continuing to improve that. I do want to say though, that it's really important for us to hear like what the problem is and what you think the solution is. But there's like people help you work out the details of, of how to make this, this work. I'm looking at you, Kim, on that housing one. Um, of how, how do we figure out really good long-term solutions that make sense? Um, I'm taking notes in here. I, I, I miss being in person, but I, I can take notes and I can send email off to people and get answers live, which is much harder to do when you're sitting on a panel in a little, in a little row listening to people. Uh, you look bad if you're typing. Here I can say, Steve, what's this? Is this working? Why is this that way? Um, hopefully we can get some of these problems fixed without you having to bother the legislature about it. But on some of them, you're going to have to. And we're excited to work with you and make the world better for kids, uh, better for young people. And we'd like to figure out how to help help launch. Um, so I, I want to thank you for the ideas. And I'm going to go figure out what that wait list is on extended foster care because we need to fix whatever that problem is. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. And I would like to do this in person, though, even if I can't ask questions of my staff live. So thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to be here and be present. Um, it's quite amazing. I'm very grateful to be here with you all. Um, Jesus. Okay, hold up. Hold up. Um, someone is now promoted, and everyone is invited to stay here. <laughs> Hybrid model, please forgive us. <laughs> um, we are actually going to do our award ceremony now, and you are invited to stay on. Um, but before we get into that, I would like to uh, do a little bit of a special message from development. So again, thank you all for being here and being a part of our 2022 Youth Leadership Summit meeting and for staying on to watch our award ceremony. Now is the moment to make a gift of support to the Mockingbird Society. You can either use the QR code on the screen, text GIVE to 833-330-0955, or go to the mockingbirdsociety.org. Our work is stronger when community members like you show up in support of the power of lived experience. By giving to the Mockingbird Society, you are investing in youth voice and our youth-led advocacy work. Again, you can use the QR code, text GIVE to 833-330-0955, or go to mockingbirdsociety.org. And we will put those options in the YouTube live chat at this time as well. Thank you again for your support and for showing up for the young people in our community. We did it. <laughs> Now, for the fun part, I would like to take a moment for all of you to come up, show everybody the impact that we have here in person, and uh, give a little bit of closing before our award ceremony. Come on up. We did it. And there's a huge team also behind us and an audience that we have here. <laughs> Come on in, squeeze in. There's more. <laughs> Over here. Over here, y'all. <laughs> we did it. Holy cow, look at us. Woo! <laughs> Everybody get in, everybody. Squeeze in. Squeeze in, squeeze in, everybody. Hang over there. Trample. <laughs> That's a keyword word magic. Dog pile. <laughs> oh, we have Queenie. <laughs> it does not end here. Um, thank you, everyone, for your strength, vulnerability, power, and voice. 
And thank you to all who are here. The best way to get involved with us is reaching out to us, reach out to me, engagement coordinators, our website. Um, we accept people between the ages of 13 to 26 and um, those who have lived experience in foster care or homelessness. We want them a part of this work. So reach out to me at my email um, or go to the Mockingbird Society and let's grow this community that we have now. Thank you all for being here and we can start our award ceremony. Okay, now we're officially going to get into our awards ceremony. Um, I am going to have uh, Jim uh, start presenting and uh, get into it. You all deserve it. Thank you. Does he want to be on the? Yeah, I can move the podium or if we want to. Great, great. Can you turn the floor? Just push it upward and you're done. Oh. <laughs> Great. Well, here I am again. Hello. Great to be here. Uh, I think one more round of applause for these really young people. No one has said round of applause because my child would change. I could never snap my finger to save my life. <laughs> well, I'm so honored to be asked to uh, present this year's ACE Award. The Mockingbird Society has a long history of being gracious and thanking our champions uh, and our many champions for our collective mission. And the, the list continues to grow. You saw many of them here today. Justice Madsen, Representative Callan, Senator Wilson, Senator Wynn, uh, Executive Director of OHY, Jim Justice. So many uh, want you all to be successful. But today I have the honor to talk about uh, and thank someone who has been an ongoing champion for Mockingbird and our collective mission for decades. First as a member of the House of Representatives and most recently as a senator, uh, this guy sponsored many, many, many of our legislative proposals and our budget provisos. In fact, even in this most recent session, he sponsored the budget proviso for the Mockingbird family. But he also attended Many, many youth advocacy days and many, many summits. I can remember one when he was talking at youth advocacy day in Olympia and it was storming on the campus uh, and the whole darn tent started to blow over and he kept telling you how important it is for you to go and talk to legislators. But he also welcomed young people into his office to listen to them, to make sure he knew what they thought and wanted before he took that legislation to the House or the Senate floor. He's been a champion for treehouse and educational advocacy. He's been a champion for really complicated climate change and open government kind of policies that are really intricate. And he prioritized our issues as just important as those issues. So I'm proud to call him a friend and a colleague and in many ways a mentor. When I first started Mockingbird, we were in a, a, a room that was barely room for a desk. And he came down and visited us and wanted to hear about what we're doing. So uh, he's been a friend of yours and ours for many, many, many years. Please help me welcome and honor uh, this year's ACE Award recipient, Senator Ruben Carlisle. <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure and a blessing it is to be, to be with you. Thank you. I'm Reuben Carlisle, and it has been my honor to be your partner in service. Um, the hybrid experience isn't uh, easy, but it reminds us of the magic and the wonder and the power of community and of getting together. So thank you to everyone in person and those uh, online. We all know the line from Martin Luther King that the arc of history bends toward justice. The arc of history, in terms of Mockingbird's work, uh, bends toward progress and results and steps in the right direction, year after year after year. Every year, you and your predecessors have shown up, just shown up with authenticity, with real stories, 
uh, with the reality, with pain, with uh, hurt, with anger, with joy, with love, all of those deep underlying sentiments that make this real is what creates real agendas that then move into action. So you know that intellectual. What I want to remind you of is to feel it emotional, to understand that when you show up with a real conversation and look at someone and tell them your story, and then the team presents the legislative agenda, the ideas that you have built here, it brings it together. It brings the policy, the personal, the political, and the action together. And that's what makes progress. I am so proud that over these years, I think virtually every year I've sponsored one of the priorities or another. Um, and then behind the scenes with uh, Ross Hunter and uh, so many others, and when we were fighting for budget, when we were just, when, uh, you know, doing right when no one's looking is the hard work. And in, uh, in those budget negotiations, when we were fighting for funding and fighting for programs, uh, it's just an honor to to know that um, that uh, that there was so much inspiration behind the work, and that those agendas had so much thought behind them. There's so many organizations and people and systems who hire a lobbyist and the big fancy law firms downtown come up with some bill. It's just so different. It's so authentic. It's so real, and it's based on lived experience and stories. And that's why every year we have meaningful progress. My message for you is to see what is not seen. We all carry perceptions and stereotypes and cliches in our mind. We have images in our mind of who someone is and we judge so quickly. Our political system is struggling under the weight of that shallow perception. You bring not just a human voice, but issues and ideas that touch real people living real lives. Please show up. Get your friends. Show up. It matters. It's not a cliche. It's not an image. It's not a stereotype. That's where it really matters. And all of us in Olympia know that when you walk down the road, when you walk down the chambers with your... Uh, with the scarves, we know what it means that Mockingbird's in the house. So it really, truly, genuinely matters. It's been my honor to be your partner in service. I'm not running for re-election this year. I'm uh, stepping back from the legislature after 14 years. And uh, we all know it's easy to get folks to vote the right way. We need people to do the hard work when no one's looking. And that's the kind of part we have. Thank you so much for all your work. I'm still proud of your partner in service and will continue to do so for years to come. Thank you so much. I'm not a heel gal. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for advocating that we need to be present and we need to be here and do the work and open it up for young people. That's what we're all about. I am actually going to start our award ceremony. Um, I'm going to call you up one by one to receive your advocacy award. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you in the back. <laughs> um, and I'd love you to come receive this award and just show the participation and just a little dedication to the work that you've done today and the work that you'll continue to do. Y'all ready? Yeah. Okay. First, we have Megan. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next we have Lucas. Thank you. We have Lacey Morgan. <laughs> Next, we have James. <laughs> <laughs> I think a Um, Aaron Fenton. <laughs> Bunny Garcia Owen. <laughs> I was petting the dog. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you buddy. <laughs> Next we have Caitlin Wallen. <laughs> Next, we have Joseph Cook. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Mayana Jones. <laughs> Next we have Jayla Young. Thank you, Jayla. Next we have Miranda Hunter. <laughs> It's quite long, isn't it? <laughs> I'm all yeah, it's right, so. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think okay, well, the next and last is pink. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. I think all the awards are passed out. Thank you all so much. I don't think the certificate does the amount of justice, but it's an appreciation. Just so you know that we see you. We appreciate your work. And it does not end here. This is just summit. Next, we have the advocacy day and all the work in between. And uh, I just want to say thank you a million times. Thank you. And I think I'm going to pass on to our youth programs director, Sharn. Um, hello, everybody. I was told that this portion wasn't going to be live stream, is it? Are we still, are we still live stream? Okay, so we are actually going to close out. Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. We're going to do a couple of words once we close out the live stream. But just one more time, thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time.